So today I want to talk to you about sustainable schools in the context of marketing and marketing integrated technology within the school. So we've been talking a lot about um, really actionable practical things today in areas of finance and development and so today I want to shift a little bit to marketing and talk about where we are now and what that looks like going forward into the future. So do a little bit of vision casting for you of what schools could look like in the next five to ten years and the implications that that could have on your school growth and enrollment. So um, first I'm going to do a short little mini separate introduction. So um, I come at this from a lot of different perspectives. I've been in marketing a really long time. I've been in and around education even longer. I come from a ridiculous family of educators. Um, my grandparents were educators, all my aunts and uncles are, my sister and her husband are, my mom is a teacher, and so I've been around it a long time, and I used to say there is no way I am ever going to work in that space. I'm going to branch out and do something different, teaching, you know, that's not for me, and then I find myself doing this, so everything comes full circle. Um, but one of the other interesting perspectives is that I am technically a millennial parent, which I know a lot of you have probably been talking about in terms of recruitment in your own schools. But then I also have a child, and her name is Isabel, and she just turned six. So she is a hard five, soft six, and she is the epitome of Generation Z. So she is, de she is the prototypical um, you know, kindergartner, first grader that you would be trying to recruit to bring in your school foundationally. They were, we talked a little bit earlier about the importance of a second grader versus a seventh grader, and she is the kind of kid that you will definitely, you're seeing now in your classrooms, but in the next five years will become even more prevalent. And she's very dramatic, as you can tell. <laughs> so first, does anyone know what game this is from? Video game? It's been around a long time. All right, it's Oregon Trail. Oh, oh yep. Forgot we've got two songs. Oh, oh. <laughs> there she is. All right. Oh, 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 it's Oregon Trail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you win the prize. You have dysentery. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so this was kind of my first introduction into school technology. We had a couple stations in my school, these old computers, I had no idea what they were. And we would play Oregon Trail in conjunction with some of our history lessons. And this was a long time ago. And I don't know how dysentery fits in with history, but they made it work. So things have come a long time. So it's interesting, the people in this room, me, you, all of us, we're kind of the last remaining generation that will remember the before and after. So we will remember before computers. Now we are certainly all using computers. I always think it's interesting. I do a presentation similar to this on attracting millennial parents, and it drills down into a lot of different millennial-specific things to look for when you're recruiting those types of parents. But the one thing that people type of, uh, usually assume when you're talking about recruiting a younger generation is that they are so wildly different. And you always say things like, oh, those millennials are so difficult. And um, you'll see an article online all the time about working with millennials and how they expect, it to, they expect to get promoted in a year or six months. And they want to have long lunch breaks and flexible work hours. And they're just so annoying. <laughs> but the reality is that technology doesn't trickle down. It trickles up. And all of you, I'm sure, have cell phones and have been looking at them all day. So um, even the millennials are really focused on their cell phone and mobile use and mobile payments. All of those things translate to every group of people now. It's not just a generational thing. However, when we look forward to the next series of student, things are going to really change in terms of the school and classroom implications. Because even though we personally use a lot of technology, that hasn't always translated into the classroom yet. And there, there are a couple reasons and challenges behind that that we're going to talk about. Oh, there we go. All right, so for just a second, I want to, you to imagine you are my highly spirited five, hard, soft, hard five, soft six, your old child, who is basically still a five-year-old. And I want you to think about the nostalgia that you will feel in 10 years when you look back at technology at ages five and six. It's a lot different than us. We look back and we say, oh, remember when we got our first flip phone? Remember when we got our first laptop? They will have no nostalgia around hardware. 
It's all going to be software. So they're going to say things like, oh, remember when Snapchat was a thing? Or remember when Facebook existed? So the mindset is completely shifting. It's not so much the usage of the hardware and how cool the hardware is. It's what the hardware can do for them. And that's what's translating to the classroom as well. I'm sure that some of you have Chromebooks in the schools. We mentioned that earlier, iPads. But it's not so much about the hardware existing. It's what's being done with the hardware. And that's the thing that's going to have the real impact on the education over the long term. The other thing about this that's interesting is that in today's culture, just generally speaking, parents and children believe technology is an absolute right, not a privilege. So you have parents that are, are willing to hand a $500 iPad to a three-year-old who could just throw it and break it, but they do it because they know that it's offering some value to that student. And that, pre that presents a real challenge to um, administrators and to educators because we are living in a world where technology is not so much a cool thing. It's just a way that, it's just something that's integrated into every single part of our lives. So that presents a real challenge for schools when they are doing marketing and recruiting because it's not so much we have Chromebooks, but you have to start thinking, what are you doing with them? And is it actually affecting change within the classroom? All right, so just to give you an example of what this might look like in the real world. So let's say you have a meet the teacher night. I'm sure some of you have those at your school where you go in and see the classroom, meet the parents, meet the teacher, the kids can meet their new friends, and so on. So I'm sure that at some point you're gonna do something cool like a tech introduction and say, hey, guess what, this is so exciting. We are now a one-to-one -one school, one-to-one -one device school. And for a parent, they're just gonna shrug. And they're going to say, well, okay, but we're two to one at home, three to one at home. Why does one to one in a classroom setting make a difference in the education? So we were talking earlier, too, about the importance of the academic standards within the school, the quality of the academics as a whole. And this is where this really comes in, because we have to make the value proposition of one to one more than just the fact <coughs> that it exists. Because that's not enough of an incentive for a parent to say, why are you better than another school just because you're one-to-one -one in a couple of classrooms? So right now, it's a definite privilege to be one-to-one -one in a classroom. But eventually, it will be considered a right to be one-to-one -one in a classroom. And furthermore, how is that going to affect my child over the long term? What are they getting out of this beyond the fact that they just have iPads in maybe second grade? Or Chromebooks in seventh grade? Where are we getting more value out of that? So let's talk about that a little bit here. All right, so here's kind of the bottom line. There's so much ed tech out there, tons. You know what that feels like. When teachers are evaluating the solutions that they can use in their own classrooms, it's absolutely overwhelming. I read an article, I think a week ago, that was like 500 best ed tech tools for the classroom in 2017. And if you're a teacher reading through that, it's completely overwhelming. You have no way to determine whether they're actually successful. And if the school comes in and says, we want you using these 10, that's even more problematic because you know adoption rate is low. There's a training component. There's a budget component. And if you invest a lot of time and energy into specific pieces of technology that don't pan out and teachers don't use and students are kind of bored with, then you're kind of back to square one and it's better not having it at all, which I suspect is the case in a lot of schools. You try things, they don't work. I know at one school I talked to, they're like, we have Chromebooks everywhere, racks of Chromebooks, and they never get touched, never. And I think that the reason for that comes back to a lot of these things, because it's hard to get teachers in for training. It's hard for a teacher to look at their curriculum and say, where does this fit into the big picture? There's no handbook for this either. So it'd be great if I could come up here and say, hey, A, B, C, D, E, this is how you do it successfully. This is how you get everybody on board. This is how you get everybody thinking about these things. And this is how it's successful. But because it's so new and everybody's doing it a little different, and it's so constrained by the community that you serve, the budget resources that you have, and your teacher population, that there's no handbook yet for how to implement this and implement it perfectly. So when we look at this and we think about large-scale implementations, that may not be the way to go. We have to bring it down a little bit to a classroom-by-classroom -classroom implementation and think about how we can market more per classroom than to market technology 
on a wider scale, school-wide, and say we do this for the entirety of the school. Instead, focus in on individual grades and talk about what you're doing at different grade levels. Ooh, we have a technical difficulty. <laughs> All right. So the first thing we need to do is evaluate the student. Now, it gives us a good place to start. So there's a couple things about the needs of the digital student that have really changed, and you can start affecting these today and start thinking about them today. And then as we move forward into the future, then you have even more opportunities to start really drilling down and coming up with some actionable things that you can do on a long, longer term plan. So here's what we can do in a year. Here's what we can do in two years. And here's where we have to be in five years to be competitive in this market. Because parents will have bigger expectations for a private Catholic school experience than they will for a public school experience around these items. So first, the digital student is computer illiterate and will be even more so over the next few years. And that sounds crazy because I'm talking about how <laughs> students are so technology minded, know how to use iPads, know how to use phones, know how to use tablets. But the key thing about that is that they don't really have to type at all. What they're doing is using apps and it's all touch screen. My daughter will walk up to my TV, which is not a smart TV, when I have Apple TV on, and she tries to press the app buttons because she expects that everything is a touch screen. And that it will be the experience going forward. Everything should be touchable and interactive. But parents have a vastly different understanding of the world. There are so many industries now that will continue to need really comprehensive technical skills. When we talk about coding, you can't code with two fingers. I mean, you could, <laughs> but it would take a really long time. So when we're talking about STEM, STEAM, bring coding into the classroom, how can they do that if they don't know how to type? So there are some fundamentals that have to happen in order for students to really make this work. And that's just one part of it. I mean, if you ask a eight-year-old how to print a document, turn a Word document into a PDF, create an outline, um, just type something basic, they would have no idea how to do that. They may not even know what PowerPoint is. And businesses will continue to do these for quite a while. So when parents are looking for a value add with a school, we always jump to the craziest furthest thing. We need to have this amazing science lab with tons of equipment and STEM and um, beakers everywhere and all this integrated technology, but we also still need to have typing classes and teach students how to use computers because that's what they're going to be doing when you talk about programming, engineering, all of these careers depend heavily on computer literacy and there's a huge education component to this with your marketing. So when you talk to parents and you're telling them we do these things, you have to explain why it's important. STEM is fine, but you have to explain how the skills that they're learning in the classroom would actually apply to that industry down the road. Parents now are preparing their students for eventual careers based not so much upon um, uh, what the student may have passion in, but what they think that will be a viable career down the road, which is why STEM is such a thing, because those careers are super viable and will be for some time. So you have to explain that what will work in that industry, those skills have to be developed at a young age. And if you are providing that level of education, then that is a value add over the competitor schools in your area. And that is a really good marketing message to justify the cost of tuition. If you are preparing students for college in these big and small ways, even from a young age. The second item here is um, passion-based learning or competency-based learning. So this kind of plays into what I was just talking about too. So in a, an increasingly automated work environment where work is being outsourced, skills will be important like collaboration, creativity, um, out-of-the-box thinking, and all of those are sort of getting tied into competency-based learning or passion-based learning. The thing is, parents don't know that word. Parents don't know a lot of these education words, but they know what it is when you explain it. So if you say, hey, we're a school that values competency-based learning. Our assessments cover a variety of topics. We don't just do grade level assessments, we also do skill-based assessments. And if you walk through what that actually means, they say, oh, that's perfect. My kid would really gravitate to that. 
or that makes a lot of sense for my family, as opposed to you know just throwing keywords out on your website. Because parents don't understand. They need a little bit more marketing education around what that value actually brings to the table. The third thing is the prevalence of technology and how it engages the student and how that plays into the classroom. Every parent knows that tech is engaging to students because if you're at a restaurant and your kid's acting up, you like throw them the phone, go look on YouTube, do whatever. And they're completely engaged by that. So parents believe that the mere appearance of technology in a classroom means that the student will be more engaged. That's not necessarily the case. And we have to make sure that we make it clear that the technology is actually tying into the curriculum in a real way. Additionally, there is this expectation that technology will have to go beyond what it's already offering. So when I was, I forget how old I was, maybe sixth grade or something, we weren't allowed to use calculators for any of our math classes. And it was big no-no, no calculators. And then you get to high school and you have to buy a $180 graphing calculator. <laughs> and that's all you use. Now students are saying, well, this tech is available, but not just like that. It's not just a calculator. If I'm doing my homework and it's asking for percentage calculations, you can go to percentagecalculator.co and you can answer every question doing your homework. So if technology can provide us that level of information, then what can we offer above and beyond that? We have to get to a point where they, can't, where they are using technology in a way that's not answering the questions, but is leading them to a conclusion, where it is helping them move to a new way of learning and not just acting as an easier way to get an answer. Um, another thing that is really important about this is, well, let me just give you an example first. So I mentioned that my sister and her husband are both teachers. They're high school English teachers at two different schools. So my sister's school um, it is in a lower income area, and the school doesn't have so much budget to work with, so they don't have a lot of this going on. And um, her husband's school has tons of money, and they have made all the English classrooms one-to-one -one with Kindles. So they often lesson plan together and do the same lessons because their schools both have the same standards. So anyway, they're teaching this one unit and my sister has reading time in the classroom, assigns the reading. They can do a worksheet okay. You know, they can kind of crank out the answers. They seem engaged, but they fail every test. They fail every assessment. And they're like, I just don't remember. You know, that was 75 pages ago. I have no idea what I read. But John's classroom that used the Kindles, they <coughs> passed, the entire class passed every single test. And they would sit in the class, read on their Kindles, and somehow they're retaining the information more. And why is that? Why would you retain more information reading on a Kindle than reading from a page? And the reason is that's how they've learned to learn. They've learned that highlighting text is with a finger, not a highlighter. And so it just speaks to the level of engagement that can be important in the classroom rather than superfluous. The calculator is great for getting an answer, but you're not learning anything by learning how to use a calculator. However, by learning to use a Kindle, you're learning how to read. You're learning how to draw key points out of the text. You're learning how to make reading applicable to your sphere of understanding. Does that make sense, everybody with me so far? Okay, great. All right, so how do we market this to the communities? How do we get this to the parents? Because we talked about the student, but now we get to take this to a parent level. And there's a couple different things, and I'm gonna back up a little bit and get out of the classroom because we need to talk about this from a school perspective first too. So the most important differentiator for most parents now is your ability to communicate with them. And that can mean a lot of different things. You're either communicating on the front end why your school is better than competitor schools, or you're communicating once their student is enrolled, communicating from classroom to home, school office to home, and what that all means. So a good example of this is offering live chat customer support on your school website. That's a first step for a prospect to be able to get a hold of you and ask a quick question without having to come into the school, because I'll, or call for that matter. I don't like calling, I like talking to someone because I'm an introvert. <laughs> and I would prefer not to pick up the phone and have to ask a question. I would like to type it 
and get a response. So I talked to a school recently who implemented this and she said it's the best thing they've ever done. They do occasionally get messages from parents who are like, why is nobody picking up my call? <laughs> and, but most of the time it is prospects who are just asking really quick questions. Like, can you give me more information about the, your sixth grade program? Can you give me more information about tuition? Where's the link to financial aid? I couldn't find it. Things like that. So this is a quick and easy way for you to start communicating that your school is integrating tech from a marketing perspective and from a broader school perspective. And that lends a certain viewpoint of your school as a whole. If you are offering this kind of service to prospective families at that level, then they probably have a, will have a good experience once they're at, inside the classroom, once that student's inside the classroom. Another thing is open houses and school tours. And I talk to schools all the time. We're trying to refine this process because as you know, it's hard to get parents to come to these things. And one way you can do that, and there's tons of different ways you can do it now, really creative ideas. But one way is to offer online sign-up times so that they can choose the time they want to come in. And they're not just given, you know, like 11.30 Tuesday next month, which is hard for people to do. You could also do things like Facebook Live tours, which is becoming more popular. So you kind of just walk through the school with a phone and then answer questions in real time at the end of it. And these kinds of options lend a certain credence to your school where you're saying, okay, if they do this kind of thing, this school must really understand how technology is actually helping the parents and students within that institution. Obviously, the ability for a parent to check grades, attendance, communicate with parents, and make online payments is a massive component of this. If you have integrated technology in the classroom, but parents still have to pay by check, or parents still have to kind of figure out a way to find out if their kid was tardy that day through some roundabout process or get a call from the school, that's not ideal either. So we want to make sure that that's entirely streamlined. Text message communication is becoming huge as well. So text, me text messages on the prospect side and on the back end side with your enrolled families is a really good way to start to instill a culture of technology and the respect for technology within the school. Um, so instead of calling a prospect and saying, hey, we haven't gotten that second reference from you, that second reference form, or you missed this part of your application, you send them a text instead and say, here's a link directly to the application, don't forget to go fill it out. And then once you have an enrolled family, what you can do is send them text message alerts on everything from closures to delays to reminders about field trip forms. And if you're really smart, you'll put a link to the field trip form in that text because you know how hard it is for parents to send paper back. Um, they usually just throw it out, which I do occasionally, and then have to figure out where it went. Another thing is um, flipped classroom curriculum. So we're going to kind of transition to the classroom now. Flipped classrooms don't just help the students and the teachers. It's a huge advantage as a parent. So what's you know, the biggest complaint that you hear from parents, especially when you get into upper grades? It is helping with homework, assisting with homework. It is frustrating for parents, especially parents who learned how to do algebra 20 years ago. And so they're trying to teach their kid one way, and the kid goes back into the classroom and says, no, well, that's, my mom said this way, and the teacher's saying this way, and mom, you're driving me crazy. And it's really confusing for the student. Flipped classrooms allows, and I, I don't know how many of you already maybe do that a little bit in your school, but it's great because it puts the onus on teaching on the parent and the student at home. So they're sitting down watching a lesson that the teacher's recorded or they're watching a video that explains a concept, so they're learning it together, if they want, or just the student. And then they go back into the classroom the next day, the teacher doesn't have to spend time saying, okay, here is a fraction, this is what it looks like, this is what it does. Instead, in the classroom, the teacher has the ability to differentiate the curriculum, separate people into groups, do collaborative activities, have time for projects, and have time for reinforcement. And that really makes a huge difference in retention and engagement and learning. The other thing that you need to think about in terms of parents and marketing and communication, and this is a little bit more broad now, not just specifically about technology, but this is absolutely key to the sustainability of a school, is reaching the diverse and varied socioeconomic uh, members of your community. So there are a couple things you want to think about there. First, 
is reducing the stigma and the hurdles of financial aid because that's often really a hard hill to climb for a family, especially if this is their first time looking at a private school. It can seem scary, the process can seem long, they don't want to have the financial aid kid in the school. And so reducing the stigma around that is really important. You can do that with how you message financial aid. You can say that it's sort of a sliding scale aid or index-based tuition or whatever you want to call it, but parents will think of it more like um, a payment plan or something rather than, oh, well, my kid's the financial aid kid and, oh, I can't find all my tax forms. Making that process as easy and smooth and normal as possible is, and online as well really takes a lot of the scariness out of the financial aid process. Also having family resources available, and a lot of that can come out of a diversity committee at your school or a diversity director who really drills down into these issues and thinks about more broadly how to apply curriculum into the classroom that is culturally, culturally diverse and respectful of every student in the classroom and it is more inclusive of every student in the school. All right, next is students. So what the students are going to be thinking about in terms of their instruction and the technology in the classroom. So differentiated instruction. Right now, that is a big thing, but it's also the sign of a distinguished teacher. So the distinguished teacher is the one who can differentiate every lesson that really puts this at the forefront of what they do. It's a priority. Soon, this will no longer be the sign of a distinguished teacher. This will just be the expectation of the work that they do. They will be expected to provide personalized and differentiated education within the classroom and find ways to do that. And the ways that you do that will revolve around technology because that will make it a lot easier for that to happen. If you have to sit down and you have to come up with handwritten worksheets for four to five different groups within the classroom, that's a lot of work. As opposed to having an app that can do that hard work for you and you can separate it out that way. It's just one example. So differentiated education works best when you have active learning environments too. Parents know what an active learning environment is, but they would not be able to explain to you what it is. They will just know it when they see it. And that's when you start to think outside the box. Instead of organizing your school by grade level, for example, you could organize certain subjects by interest. So you could have fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh graders who are interested in engineering in the same class, or you could have second and third graders who are interested in science doing a project in another. You're tying the, um, you're moving the children into areas where they're talented and interested and want to learn more. And that is what a parent would identify as an active learning environment. And they would say, this is really engaging for the student. And you can tie technology into that curriculum in a way that's really compelling. Adaptive and contextual learning is another area that I think is going to become more and more important over time. So um, if you have an LMS system that you're currently using, this is a good baseline for that. So what you would be doing is you would pr be providing um, contextual learning that is app-based. And it, it's kind of hard to explain what it does, but I'm going to do my best. So Smart Sparrow is a good example of this. You have an app on your iPad and the student opens it and is doing a lesson on, let's say, soil erosion, and they're working through it. The app identifies where they're having trouble, and the lesson changes as they move through the questions to suit the student's learning style. So maybe the app is discovering this student would learn better through a video. Maybe this student would learn better in an interactive format, you know, moving, manipulating things around the screen. So that kind of contextual learning is really hard to do with traditional curriculum. But a lot of um, apps and software is making this really easy for students to do. And it has a great effect. Because then you're learning the way that you're supposed to be learning. And the app can identify that. And it takes some of the onus off the teacher as well. The other thing is data-driven assessments. So this is really important to assess um, how well the student is doing not only on a broad level, but it helps develop crucial skills later on in life, which includes communication, collaboration, and saying, you know, here's a data-driven assessment that says that your child works best in a group of three people, and when they work on this project together, they do really good work. But when this student is with another group of students, the work suffers. And why is that? 
why is the student working better with some students than others? And then you start, you're able to sit down with the parent and say, here are some areas we need to work on in terms of collaboration and learning, learning with other students, peer review, and that's really important data for a parent. Those are data points that a parent would love to see in a parent-teacher conference, rather than, oh, well, you know, she's about 85% on her ABCs and about 60% on um, her numbers. So that's data that a parent can actually take and reinforce at home in a new and meaningful way. And that goes beyond the rote curriculum learning. Another thing is digital portfolios. And this is more applicable to upper grades. So instead of test-based competency, how well did you do on your tests across the board? What are your AP test scores like? What about your SAT? This focuses more on developing a digital portfolio of skills and passions that can be then translated into college applications. So instead of just being numbers and grades, you're saying this student did these projects all around coding. This student did these projects all around engineering. And eventually, this is probably going to be the way that you apply for college. Eventually, some of those tests are probably going to go away or become less important. And it will be more about what did you actually accomplish at school that's measurable that's competency-based, and that is skills-based. And that will become projects and not you know, a good grade on your AP US history test. The other thing to think about is whether the technology is fitting into the room. So a lot of times we choose our technology at school by the features that it offers. Ooh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. But that's not necessarily the best way. It has to be sort of a puzzle. So you look at what's working really well right now in classrooms, and you say, what is the best technology fit for this? As opposed to saying, how can we make our existing curriculum fit into the technology? Because that's why a lot of these things usually fail. That's where teacher adoption really plummets. Because they're like, this is the way I've been doing it. I do not want to make this fit into this app. I can do it this way without the app. Instead, you want to think about how the app functionality can be a good fit with the curriculum from the other perspective. And that's how you get more teacher adoption. But that requires a more individual thought process, too. So it's not an across-the-board, school-wide implementation. It's the sixth grader really likes to use this app to enhance these two subjects. The um, fourth grade teacher likes to use this app to talk about these subjects. And it really works for that classroom. And then you market the school based on how you're differentiating not only at a classroom level, but at a grade level. The teachers are doing what works best for their classroom and have some freedom to use the technology that makes sense for them based on their existing curriculum. Um, Minecraft Education Edition is a great example of this because you can use this same app in multiple classrooms, but the teacher can make it fit into existing curriculum and they don't have to adapt their curriculum to fit it. So you could use the my, so I have two examples here. There's one that's called fractions in real life settings. So if you're teaching fractions and you're a math teacher, you can use that to enhance your lesson. You're not replacing your lesson. Or if you're a science teacher and you're talking about deforestation, then you can use Minecraft's deforestation lesson and fit that into the overall goal that you've already established for that curriculum or objective. So I know it's a lot, but that's just a couple examples of how you can do that. Now, on the back end, when you're marketing your school, this is an enormous draw. Here's the thing about public schools um, and competing with them on an academic level. They are so uh, rigorously tied to standards and to district curriculum. Usually their curriculum is written from a district. All the public schools have to adhere to that curriculum, and they don't have the ability to do these things in the classroom because they don't have time. We have the advantage of being able to be more creative and to fit the needs of the students within the school without saying, okay, we don't have time for this today, we can push it off to tomorrow. You have the ability to sort of adapt this into the existing curriculum that you're using and that's a huge draw for parents because they don't feel like it's a cookie cutter experience. And that can apply into all the aspects of the schools that make sense including the mission of the school, um, extracurriculars that your school offers, the traditions of your school. This is another key element of that overall marketing message that differentiates you from the competitor schools in the area. All right, so here's how you can 
kind of sit down and market all of these items to your community. You can implement these messages. The first is emphasizing any individualized or passion-based education tracks that you have. So if you have an ability for a student who likes STEM to take a STEM track, and this is mostly, a lot of times this is upper schools, um, sometimes middle school, then emphasize that as a key part of your school's ethos and say, we are trying to get students where they have a natural interest and then build that interest into excellence that can translate into their success later in life. This is something that you would want to advertise on the front page of your website. This is something that you would want to put in all of your major marketing messages because this is really, really key to parents and this is something that they don't even know they want necessarily until they see it. And that's why it's so compelling. The other thing is talking about innovative learning spaces and environments. So this is as easy as having a classroom that doesn't have a typical desk board situation. If you have any learning environment in your school that is beyond the norm, that's not as quite as traditional, this is something that parents are really interested in. Oh, you know, my ki the kids can sit in this area to do this task, or um, a collaborative tech lab where they can work with you know, two or three other grades on a specific project and collaborate together as a team. One school I was in last year, I don't remember what time, but anyway, they have recently gotten rid of every book in their library and they turned their entire library area into a collaborative learning space. So they, it looked kind of like a Google sort of office where you had little tables that people could work at. There was um, high top tables with a TV that they could connect their Chromebooks or iPads to. So the students would give presentations to each other or they could work on projects at those tables. And they kept a few little books here and there for decoration, but all the library books <laughs> were on Kindles or were on iPads. And they would buy books that way so students could read on their Kindles or iPads if they wanted, which sounds crazy. And I love a library, but it was a really cool space. And when I went in, it was full of kids. Full of kids. We couldn't sit anywhere. We were walking around and they were eyeing us like, who are you? You're new. Uh, but it was a really cool space. The other thing is project-based learning with apps and video games. So a lot of times the mistake that we fall into is saying, this is a really cool app. Minecraft is a great example. This is really cool. We should do this in the classroom. This is awesome. But if there's no project behind it, if it doesn't tie into the curriculum in some greater way, then you're not getting the benefit out of it. And it will be something a teacher tries for a little while and then will drop because they'll be like, this is fun for the kids, but it's just fun. It's not tying into a learning objective. The other thing is doing hands-on activities, like STEAM-related hands-on activities, which doesn't have to be a huge budget spend. A lot of times we assume that STEM, STEAM, especially when it comes to more hands-on things, is going to be really expensive. But if you have a computer lab at your school, if you have Chromebooks or iPads, you can download software and have them start doing it immediately. This is especially really cool at the younger grade levels. So if you can tell parents that are coming in at pre-K, K, 1, 2, and say, you know, we do really elementary coding on iPads for two hours a week. That parent is signing me up. That sounds great. Um, that's really unique, and I don't see this at other schools. The other thing that's important is a learning management system. Parents really respond well to this because they can get real-time feedback from the teacher, and they can have ongoing communication and be able to review what the child is learning, communicate with the teacher, and see you implementing these things themselves. And that's really key. So if you're teaching fractions by showing a short YouTube video, and then the kids are required to write a comment on the video about their favorite part or something like that, the parent is able to see that too and is able to say, oh, okay, this is really interesting, and I can see that the kids are engaged. And that's also something you could show a prospective family and say, instead of doing this the normal way, look at how our kids are learning and interacting with this content. So, I want you to think right now about what you're marketing as your top differentiators, whether that's you know on your website or what you talk about with people when you're doing your little elevator pitch. And a lot of times on a website it could be a stock photo, sometimes you're lucky enough to have professional photos taken of your students, and it could be sports, or it could be you know the mission-based aspects of the school and the really strong spirituality aspects of your curriculum. 
but a lot of schools are saying that. And a lot of schools say the same things. My favorite time of year is when, so I live in Maryland, private schools everywhere. My favorite time of year is when the magazine comes out that's like the private school issue, and it has approximately 600 schools in it. And they all look exactly the same. And they all say the same things. They'll say great sports program, quality academics. Um, the private, the faith-based private schools are even more um, alike. A strong faith-based education for your student. And while that's all true, it's not untrue. It just looks the same as everybody else's. So you have to find ways to distinguish yourselves and get photos of your students actually doing these things. If you have students learning elementary coding on iPads in a classroom, that's the photo you use on your website. That's the photo that you put in your ad. Because that would get me, as a parent, to stop a lot earlier than you know small class size ratios. That's not going to get me to stop on an ad. That's not going to intrigue me on a website because we're all using the same marketing messages now. So when you're thinking about this going forward, I think that the key has to be that the marketing message around your school is not just one simple thing. It's a more broad and complicated, complex message, but everything around that indicates that you are a school that's moving forward and that you are a school on the move. You are harnessing the technology in your school to impact student outcomes, because that's what parents really want to see. They want to see, what are the actual outcomes that we're getting out of this? What are the things that we can say, you know, our kid entered the school here, now they're here. And it has been an enormous help for us. And then you get that parent, and you have them give a testimonial, and you put that on your website. That's what you really want that life cycle to look like. And that's where the value of the investment in private education comes in. It's not necessarily about the fact that you exist, but what you exist as now and what you will look like in five years and communicating that to people so that they are willing not only to enroll their, fan their students within the school, but that can translate to development as well. So if you are reaching out to key constituents, you can say, look, this is our five-year plan. Look what we're doing in the classroom now. Look what we're going to be doing in five years. How do we get there with you? So there's a lot of different applications for this that are really beneficial for schools. All right, so that's it. I know I just threw a lot at you in a very short amount of time, but um, any questions in the room? Or any feedback, too, if you're already doing some of these things and you want to share what you're doing well? Feel free to speak up. I have a question. Yeah. The live chat you mentioned about website, is that something you do through your website director or is that something you can bring in privately through something that's already offered online that you can just add to? Yeah, so exactly that. So there's a couple different services that um, offer that and you basically install some code on your website and what it will do is when you're in during the day, you mark yourself as in mm -hmm. and it will send you a little message if someone messages you, otherwise it's just quiet. And if when you go home for the day, you turn it off and it will say, sorry, we're not here right now, but leave a message and we'll get back to you. And then the next day you can respond to the ones that you've missed. I mean, you could leave it on all night if you want, but <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> you talked about um, like doing like kind of like um, a cold grade learning. So like say fourth, fifth, and sixth, you talked talk about as an example, or second and third, mm -hmm. doing like science. Have you been in schools that are doing anything like that? I haven't personally been in schools doing things like that, but I've read about it. This is really new, and not a lot of schools are doing this yet, but they're moving that direction by subject now. But I've read a couple things that insinuate that at some point schools will try to move that direction holistically because you can cut the number of teachers in half. Right. And so you can have teachers that are really well versed in a certain topic teaching four grades. And so instead of having a second grade teacher, you have a science teacher that can teach four grades, if that makes sense. So you're moving to more of a high school model for younger grades. Chucky, e, there are actually um, the Diocese of Portland, Oregon has gone to this direction with multiple grade level classes and blended learning concepts. And what drew them in this direction was in a lot of their rural schools, the staffing costs were becoming problematic and right. it was a way to keep schools viable. 
but they have done some research and they have some things that are in place if you wanted to try to contact their superintendent. Yeah, I love, awesome. I, I love the idea. I, I guess I'm just thinking of the logistic nightmare that it might be. Yeah. Um, you can place space though that you can move people into. And I think the con the blended learning aspect right. of that is really key. Yeah. Because you could have them using the same app that automatically differentiates the curriculum for that group so that you're not the teacher personally responsible. So there's a school that we work with that has a blog, which I encourage schools to do on their website to keep the website as active as possible, which is good for your Google search rankings. It's another presentation. And um, they have a blog, a series of blog posts right now about digital citizenship and about how that applies to their school, the technology that they're learning in the classroom. And that's a really good example of how a parent would be not only learning about the technology that the school has, but also that the school is a very responsible outlook for using the technology and teaches digital citizenship along with it. And that's the kind of thing that a parent would research before they even contact you, right? So they're looking at your website, they're going through your website, they read that blog post and they're like, oh, you know, these guys really know what they're doing around this. So it's those kinds of little triggers that can make a big difference because, you know, when I was looking for a preschool a couple years ago for my daughter, I did not contact any schools until I had online vetted all of them. And that puts schools in a precarious position because not only am I looking at the website, but I'm also reading reviews that you may or may not have control over. So then that requires a different set of initiatives around making sure that the parents who are huge fans, ambassadors of your school, are also contributing to those review sites because people do read them. And then there's Facebook groups, which is a whole other uh, bucket of worms about parents who are saying, ooh, do not step through that door. And you don't even know that conversation is happening. So that's that rabbit hole that you can go down that starts at the website and then just branches. It's like three more presentations right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else? Okay, great. Well, feel free to contact me. Find me on LinkedIn. My name is Jacqueline Day. It's very easy to find. There's not many of us out there. And um, feel free to reach out to me anytime if you have any follow-up questions from today. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it.